In Africa, Keto has traditionally been taken as a symbol of wealth by our forefathers. They would keep Keto for decades and pass them down from generation to generation. Keto was and is still used in a variety of ceremonies such as marriage to repayment. Up to this day, it is still a measure of lobola currency. They are also used in family celebration ceremonies, payment of children's school fees, providing family with milk, and also be helping out in the farming fields and pulling wagons. Communal farmers only sell cattle when there is need. Many of them do own cattle, but the question is, do they really benefit from them? Welcome to Farming with Ndaraka Mwende Chana here in Zimbabwe, Africa. Our vision is to produce beef cattle raised environmentally friendly reducing carbon emissions whilst also encouraging youth and women to take farming as a business. A business that can improve livelihoods, feeding the whole nation as we address food security and job creation issues. I hope we are all going to take part in this journey, experiencing real cattle ranging in a beef, cow, cow operation. From zero until we achieve annual cash sales of one million dollars, making us millionaires through farming. Our intention is to breed calves, win them, and raise them to maturity age called backgrounding, when they are feeders before selling, and in good time, fatten to finish them. Achieving such a goal won't be easy. Is averagely, each one sells for two dollars per kg on live weight in our auctions is really good. Implying a target of five hundred dollars per each kettle, which equates to two thousand kettle sold each year. Selling two thousand kettle every year is our target, and yet not an easy feat to achieve. This requires a breeding head of 2,600 exposed to bulls each year. At 80% calf crop, we expect 2,080 calves. Assuming a 3 to 4% fertility per annum, you remain with roughly around the 2,000 target mark. There are, of course, other measures such as value addition that one could implement to achieve the million dollar cash sales per year without necessarily keeping such a large head. This pushes each cattle when processed to retain up to $2,000, implying you only need to sell 500 cattle per year. Therefore, keeping a breeding head of 650 at 80% calf crop, you retain 520 cows every year. Assuming a 3 to 4 percent fatality, you retain the 500 calves for selling. Please take note, the 80 percent calf crop can be improved to above 95 percent and the fatality percentage can be reduced to less than 1 percent. In episodes to come, we will be looking at improving those percentages and how to do so. There are two models that we are going to use as a strategy to grow our hair. One, breeding more cattle in a horizontal strategy growth by increasing the numbers and hence the economy of scale. Then selling them cheap in readily available markets such as auctions. And then two, this is another different strategy which is vertical growth. Keeping the breeding head low at 650 as opposed to 
2,600. Value adding them and achieving the same amounts of million dollar cash sales per year in five years from now. One could also diversify with the cash sales and produce cash crops or quick returning livestock such as sheep or chickens to boost sales and achieve again a million dollar sales per year. Farming with Mdara Kamunde will assist farmers when to focus on horizontal growth strategy first to achieve a meaningful head size. Then go through transition into vertical strategy whilst maintaining horizontal growth strategy and eventually fully maintain vertical growth strategy by focusing mainly on value addition. Then eventually pulling off from breeding and backgrounding to simply fattening in a feedlot setup, then process and sell directly to consumers and then diversify. Episodes to come will include how to select the right breed, how to manage pastures, how to set up cattle handling facilities, how to maintain your breed's health, how to improve its nutrition, how to select and manage your head. Also to be covered is a cattle management calendar, how to keep records, how to sell, how to relate to workers, developing them, pay them, providing housing, and so forth. The handling grievances, discipline, and above all, how to grow the enterprise to achieve set goals will also be covered. Having introduced ourselves in this episode, we will give you a brief history of how we started. Hello, good people. I am Mundara Kamombe, and we are all the Mundara Kamombes. Welcome to Farming with Mdara Kamombe. We are excited as this is our first ever episode. This vision, the ideas and how to farm is Mdara Kamombe started here in England. Thinking of my motherland, Zimbabwe and Africa. In brief, Mdara Kamombe is a term that evolved from the local community I farm with and in turn I embraced it and developed a brand around that term. Mudara in Zimbabwe refers to someone old from the past and not really a nice term that the Mudaras wants to be associated with. However, at the same time, uh, it can be used to complement when one achieves something uh, special, uh, like saying, yeah, 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 Mudara, like, yeah, yeah, good at what you do. And Kamombe's was in relationship on what that Mdara was good at. Uh, however, Ka in our language identifies something small, but then Mombe, in short, it's cattle, uh, which, which is wealth in Africa. This makes it unique, as in first part we are saying we, we, we are the best, we want to be the best, that's our intention. And on the second part, we are also acknowledging that we are young in this journey. So here we are, the Mdara Kamombes. We refer both sexes, be it women on the farm or the men as Mudara. We have young women that we farm with. Uh, we've got the young youth that we are farming with. And we maintain that balance management representation as we shall see. I've been in this country, England, for over two decades. And from day one, I had a plan of how I was going to do my own businesses and grow from there. It took long as I went through settling and that journey here wasn't easy. But here we are talking about farming. So to a certain extent, I think I'm starting to realize the dreams that I had when I started planning this project. In the years I've been here, I've worked as an engineer and in that journey targeted every single company 
uh, within the livestock value chain that helps me to understand uh, what it takes to, to run a successful cattle range. I've worked for milling companies that make stock feeds, uh, the machinery involved, uh, the magnitude, the formulations when you're making those stock feeds, the systems and processes that are implemented, such a big stock feed plant, a milling plant being run by one or two people with one or two maintenance engineers looking after the plant, uh, but producing for uh, tons and tons, probably, yeah, a lot of tons. Uh, I've also worked for a milk producing plant like Terribot, Zimbabwe, to understand the process of how you produce milk, cream, the machinery involved. I've worked for an abattoir uh, that slaughters 1,000 pigs per day, exporting to South Africa, to China. The setup, uh, the arrangement, I've worked in a sausage making plant where they, uh, they are processing, value adding to the piggery, to the pigs, processing that into sausage, into bacon. I've worked in cheese factories that mix cheese. I've worked in bakeries that value add from pastry into, you know, whether it's bread or pies that I could potentially use for value adding. I've worked into spices because I wanted to understand uh, if I was to make products like sausages, the spices involved, uh, how they are produced, how they are processed, packaged. So literally, I've followed the whole value chain in the two decades that I've worked in England, such that I, I understand the projects that I was about to undertake. So it's important that for any project that you want to do, you, you, you've got the know-how, you've got the understanding. You, you could still employ people who are experts in that field, but if you've never done it yourself, if, if you, I find it difficult for you to manage a person when you do not know what it takes to do that bit. So I intend to use that experience back here in Zimbabwe, Africa, to develop a venture that is all those elements. I did study my MBA with Liverpool University and all that to position myself into farming effectively. Zimbabwe is, we all know, has gone through a journey of its own. Uh, also, I was getting that knowledge from land reform to challenges within its economy. It is within that current positioning. I saw an opportunity to be a cell phone farmer, farming from diaspora in Zimbabwe. I noticed after the land reform, uh, most people, be it blacks or whites, they went back into farming in a JV arrangement, joint venture arrangement with the land beneficiaries. Uh, and in return uh, of farming together, they would pay seven to 10% profits to the farmer who benefited from that. For me, I did the numbers, uh, seven to 10% uh, as opposed to the land that I was benefiting from, it was a no-brainer to go back home and start farming. Uh, if you consider how much it takes here in England to buy a piece of land such that you can farm, and how much it takes to farm on the same particular land in Zimbabwe, it's a no-brainer in terms of where you should be farming. So I then went and started looking at uh, uh, renting uh, or entering into a joint venture agreement. And at some point, I think uh, we need to cover an episode just based on JVs, such that people are aware on we, how to start farming, uh, because land plays a key role. If you decide to farm without land, you won't farm, period.
So I then started planning my farming model. A uh, good business practice is to write a business plan. However, most entrepreneurs, as you know, they act first and then develop the plan as they grow, which, of course, can be argued that it's a high risk. But for me, I'm one of those who start first and start developing a business plan afterwards. I noticed in Zimbabwe, borrowing money was expensive and almost impossible. At some point, and hence used my working capital as short term to raise funds to finance the business, though in the long run, we would need to raise funds using different other means. As today, this has been our competitive advantage of being able to finance with a low interest as opposed to borrow finance in Zimbabwe at a high rate. Uh, this involved working long hours, guys, a lot of suffering. Uh, it's not easy to raise funds in the UK. Everyone who's been in the UK can tell you that for you to earn a pound, you have to put in the hours. And I've been putting the hours. We're looking at 12 hours a day. And sometimes I'll be the only engineer taking over time. And um, it is what it is, but as long as you've got a vision, a goal, anything is attainable. Then it was about identifying the right people to work with and creating a culture of transparency, of transparency and certain expected tools to work with. So this is the tricky bit when you are trying to create a specific culture of how you want to work with your team. Uh, you know, if you ask someone for a receipt, that person is quick to think, oh, you're not trusting me. But if, if you want to grow the business, uh, you have to do it in the right way, uh, right systems in place, and eventually your team will buy into it and they'll start seeing the benefits the more you communicate with them. So personally, I rely on WhatsApp groups of different groups, each addressing a certain function within the business, from record groups to invoice groups, management report, project groups, and so forth, with the same people, but discussing different matters within a specific group. This kind of like helps you to have a good uh, understanding of your functions rather than having one group where you're discussing all issues in there. So it was like putting catalogs within different groups. This did help to develop my team into understanding the functions uh, of this enterprise and help with communication. We even have a mileage group where if one use a car, we take photos on the mileage before using it, the fuel consumed, and when it has been returned and the purpose of using it. We've got sales groups, we've got stock tech groups and so forth. I did then come up with an organizational structure where people know their roles and what's expected. Uh, and I've used lean tools uh, such as standard operating procedures, work element sheets, working menus, confirmation checks, and so forth to support those systems. We also work closely with the vets, agritechs, and universities, uh, with some students being attached on the farm, giving different uh, dynamics uh, that actually supports our growth. All this was done to enable farming from diaspora being achievable through cell phone farming. So cell phone farming works in any case, even those farmers who are on the ground, mostly they are managing logistics on the phone rather than being on the ground doing the farming. As to farm, for instance, 1,000 hectares of maize can be done on three to four farms being rented on a JV agreement approved by the Ministry of Lands, but this to happen we are able to manage three, four farms. Uh, at some point you need to rely with your cell phone. 
to communicate, uh, to delegate. Uh, this, this, this is where I say we might not appreciate, but we are all cell phone farmers to a certain extent. So I do visit Zim as much as often. Uh, I've identified when it's critical, which key activities that I need to be there. And time and time again, I'll be on the ground assisting as much as I can do. So guys, uh, I'm now back in the UK, back to work. The reason why I keep going back, it's where I raise my capital. I'm raising my capital through shifts working on different contracts here in the UK. But um, what I wanted to discuss with you, it's our current position, the planning that we did put before we, we ventured into cattle reaching the competitive advantage that we believe we have and how we found an opportunity to namely farm in Zimbabwe as opposed to any other countries.